Hey, hey, we're back. This is His Word Unveiled. We are continuing in the book of Jeremiah. We've got two chapters today. Let's jump into it. Jeremiah chapters 24 and 25 will be what we cover in this video. So uh, hit that pause button. Go meet with the Lord. Let's take this seriously. Let's let things happen. Let's be changed. Let's have a newness of of um, His Holy Spirit just pouring out upon us, just taking us new places, on new adventures to new depths. Let's go at it. And let's do this on purpose, with purpose, so that eternal purpose can come out of this. Okay, here we go. You're gonna hit pause, you're gonna read, and just the quietness, the stillness of just the presence of the Lord, it's gonna mean something, it's gonna do something. Jeremiah chapters 24 and 25. I'm gonna pray this thing through and we're just gonna let God take us wherever he desires, wherever he has purpose to take us through these chapters. So, okay, we're at it. You go do your thing, I'm doing mine, and here we go. Lord, we love you, we give this time completely to you. We thank you and we praise you for just overwhelming us with you, with who you are. God, as we come towards you, if, as we come after you, Lord, you pour out, you show up, you just reveal, you give us revelation after revelation of your truth, of your love, of your power. Father, may we be so connected and in tune with you and with your heart. Father, we want you. We choose you. We choose to do life with you. We choose to walk this thing out empowered by your Holy Spirit, just entering into more and more and more. Meet us here, Father. We want you. We choose for you to be teacher today, for you to be leader, for you to be revealer. Unveil your heart to us today and just do a mighty work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah chapter 24. Let's start up. Okay. First verse. That very first verse um, kind of hits something that we have not gone over yet. Talking about um, after Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive um, Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. And the officials of Judah with the craftsmen and smiths from Jerusalem and had brought them to Babylon. So this is talking about when King Nebuchadnezzar actually comes up against Jerusalem as Jeconiah is king, who um, is the son of Jehoiakim. So we briefly hit Jehoiakim. We've hit Coniah again with the judgment coming up against him back in Jeremiah chapter 22. But this first verse is what we will talk about in the next several videos. Um, it takes us back to 2 Kings 24, which we have not hit yet, but talks about the first and the second sieges of Babylon when they come up against Jerusalem. So with that, so this is talking about after that has happened, but continues on in um Jeremiah's ministry of prophesying this and what the Lord has spoken to him. So after this has happened, after they have been taken um, away, held captive, that these sieges took place against Jerusalem by Babylon, then we see that the Lord showed Jeremiah something, gave him a vision, allowed him to, to see um, two baskets of figs set before the temple of the Lord. In verse two, it says one basket had very good figs, like first ripe figs, and the other basket had very bad figs, which could not be eaten due to rottenness. So we've got the timeline of when this took place. Again, that timeline specifically, we haven't really jumped into with details, but this is just giving a flow of what took place. So at this time, the Lord shows Jeremiah two baskets. There's this basket, this basket. This one has good figs, this one has bad figs. The bad figs, it says they were um, full of rottenness and could not be eaten. Verse four, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, thus says the Lord God of Israel, like these good figs, so I will regard as good the captives of Judah. So those who will be held captive, those who will be taken into Babylon, into captivity. So the Lord says these, these peeps, the ones um, in captivity will be considered as these good figs. The Lord says, so I will regard them in captivity in Babylon as good, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans. So the Lord those ones who he has driven out from the land, from their land of Jerusalem into Babylon. These are the good figs. We've got to hear this. We have got to take our time in this and make sure it's sinking in. So the Lord is speaking judgment. This, this is going to happen. This is going down. Judgment is going to be seen through. Part of their judgment is being taken into captivity. 
But these being taken into captivity into Babylon, the Lord considers as good. These are the good figs. So who are the bad figs? And we see that in verse 6. No, we don't. We see that in 8. But let's hit verse 6 first. For I will set my eyes on them for good. These good figs who will be taken into captivity going into Babylon, the Lord says, I will set my eyes on them for good. And I will bring them again to this land. And I will build them up and not overthrow them. And I will plant them and not pluck them up. So the Lord says, yes, this judgment's coming. They'll be taken into captivity, but I will take them from captivity. I will build them up. I will replant them. I will not overthrow them. My eyes are on them for good. Verse 7, I will give them a heart to know me. Again, this is what God's after. This is the desire of his heart. Not to destroy not to bring about judgment, not to say, I told you so, you should have listened to me, but now I get to destroy you. But God is saying this judgment, this discipline, this punishment, it's to awaken you. Everything that the Lord does, it's to wake us up. It's to bring us back into life so that we're not stuck living in, in the pathetic lives that we so often choose of just destruction and loneliness and darkness and, and being unsatisfied and un, you know, unhealthy, un-everything. The Lord says in everything that he's about, everything he speaks, everything he does is to bring us back. His desires for salvation for us, is salvation for us, is, is for us to be restored in repentance for us to live freely in life with him. Okay, so I will give them a heart to know me. That's what God's about. So we know him, so that we're in connection with our creator, the one who gave us life. For I am the Lord, he says, and they will be my people and I will be their God, for they will return to me with their whole heart. Again, what God's about? Salvation. The desire of his heart for us to be brought into connection with him, that we can connect with our creator, that he is in full connection with his creation, that intimacy, that growth, that, that clinging to, that being together, that being united, for our hearts to be united to his. That's what God is after. And then again, returning to me with their whole heart. God is a God of wholeheartedness. Completeness, entirety, fullness, that's who God is. That's his desire, that's what he's after. Bringing us in and us coming in with a whole heart. Giving him in complete, ourselves in complete surrender. Okay, those were the good figs, that one basket. The other basket then, verse eight. But like the bad figs, which cannot be eaten due to rottenness, indeed, thus says the Lord. So I will abandon Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his officials and the remnant of Jerusalem who remain in this land and the ones who dwell in the land of Egypt. Okay, my mind's going crazy. This can take us everywhere. Let's try this one step at a time so that this is clear. Father, you just speak. You just make this clear. Um, okay, verse 8 where it says, So I will abandon Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his officials. So again, Zedekiah, we haven't hit much. We maybe just mentioned his name when we were back in Second Chronicles and Kings, but we have not hit his reign yet. We have not talked much about him. So we left off a lot with Josiah when he died. We've got his sons. We've heard about Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim, and um, which that um, being Coniah too. And we've just briefly mentioned Zedekiah, but those were the kings there at the end. The three mentioned there at the end are the ones who pretty much finish up this reign of Judah before this captivity takes place. So here's Zedekiah, very last one, when this whole thing goes down and being held and being taken fully into captivity, Zedekiah. So the Lord speaks, so I will abandon Zedekiah, these bad figs, I will abandon Zedekiah, king of Judah and his officials, and the remnant of Jerusalem who remain in this land and who dwell in the land of Egypt. So the Lord says, good figs, they're the ones being hauled into Babylon, the ones freely going into captivity, the ones who refuse, the ones who remain in the land, in this land that was spoken of, that will be destroyed, that will be made a desolation, that God says, no, it's been polluted, it's been defiled, the land of Jerusalem, it will be wiped away. It will be made a desolation. It will be burned with fire. It will be done for. And the Lord weighs this out and says, Good figs, they're going to be the ones going into captivity. Bad figs, they're going to be the ones remaining on the land. And I completely forget, but this is ringing about where, um, 
where we talked, where it was so clear that the Lord says, choose, oh, right here in Jeremiah chapter 21, um, Jeremiah 21 verse 8, you shall also say to this people, thus says the Lord, behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. So the Lord is very clear, life and death. And now we see good figs, bad figs. The good figs are the ones walking into life. They're walking into captivity, yes, but this is what God says is life. And he's spoken this. He's used his prophets to make this very clear, to let the people know the direction, the instruction, the path led into life. That's into captivity. That's going into the Babylonian land, the Babylonian empire, being under them, serving them, in captivity with them. That's life. And the way of death then is one's um, remaining in the land. That was clearly put in verses 9 and 10. We see more of that that we already read about, but um, but that was huge. Those who remain in this land, God said, this land you have polluted and defiled, it's going to be wiped away. So if you choose to remain in that pollution, if you choose to remain in that defilement, if you choose, if we choose to remain in our sin, to not repent, to not turn away, to continue in it, to practice in it, to refuse to seek the Lord, to repent, to humble ourselves, to run to him. If we do that, that's death. That's destruction. It's very clear. We see that. We see that now in the practical ways of just sin. If we refuse to step away from our sin and to the Lord, then we are choosing death. Simply put, that the Lord's laid it out. Life and death, good figs, bad figs. We saw the good figs being the ones going into and serving under the king of Babylon, the bad figs, the remnant of Jerusalem, along with the king at that time, who remain in this land. In the land that the Lord said, here, this is your land, yet the people forsook the Lord. They turned away from the blessings that were intended to be in this land for them. Not only did they say no thanks, but they dwelled then in their wickedness in their evil upon that land that God gave and provided and they chose their own way upon those blessings and it turned completely away from what those blessings were turned into their own destruction. So those who remain in the land and ones dwelling in the land of Egypt. So looking towards Egypt, going into Egypt, of course we saw just that whole assault and coming up against the battle there with Egypt and coming up against Judah and, and those who, who remain in there, get stuck there, rely on the king of Egypt then, um, being under them, God is very clear. We have got to hunker in, listen to his voice, and clearly hear he's speaking through Jeremiah several times that life, those good figs, will be going into captivity, that this is punishment, that we've got to face up, you know, take responsibility. That's life. Death is remaining on this land, refusing to turn, refusing to move out of it, you know, just dwelling there, being stuck there, continuing in that practice and rehearsing there, remaining in the land. And the Lord clearly said, this is death, death for all those who stay in the land. The land that has been, um, has been spoken against that will be destroyed. Um, going into Babylonian captivity was God giving them mercy, giving mercy and life to the people. He was fighting for them. They were already in their own captivity. Like, we've got to understand that. They were in their own captivity, wasting away outside of the blessings of God. We just said that, that God gave them the land that they refused. No, they, they took those blessings that God said and they smothered them and polluted them with their own evil. They were already in their own captivity. They were dwelling in just the, the restlessness and the gunk of their own lives and doing what they want, being unsatisfied, not full, not protected, not secure, not stable, no peace, nothing was there. They were living in that captivity, not being aware that they were chained, that they were bound by their own decisions and the wickedness that they were living in, but they were in captivity. And we can see this, that this is God saying, um, up then again in verse um, in verse 5, regard as good whom I sent out of this place. Verse 6 again, set my eyes on them for good. This captivity and bringing them into Babylon, this is the goodness of God. This is the mercy of God. That God was removing them from their own captivity, from the things that they've set up to worship and to bow down to. And God said, no, those things need to go because those things are polluting my people. Those things are destroying my people. What they have chosen, they're destroying my people. So God saw them in captivity already and in the goodness 
and, and the, the grace and the mercy that he holds for his people, the desire of bringing them into restoration and healing and salvation. He took them from the captivity they were already in and led them away into captivity to wake them up saying, no, you're being destroyed here. I'm going to take you in here another direction. And if you trust me, if you turn to me, if you obey and listen to me and do what the Lord is about ready to tell them to do, then they will live. Then God will restore them. God is giving them clear instructions and it's all out of the goodness of his heart. They were wasting away outside the blessings of God just living in their land and what they were doing. God says, I've got another way. And God chose to save them from the restless lives that they were living in and said, hey, this isn't going to be easy. But if you're ready to trust me, if you really want restored, if you really want full and satisfied, if you really want to live in freedom, then here, come into this captivity. Guys, it doesn't make sense. Hearing, hearing myself say that, reading this, it doesn't make sense. The goodness of God, the mercy of God is, is revealed through his leading them into captivity But that's the reality of it. God said, this is for your good. I've got my eyes on you. I've got plans and purposes for all of this. And what I'm doing, I know what I'm doing. And this is for your good. Because we know, we've read in his word, we know the desire of God's heart. The desire of his heart is for us to be free, for us to live in connection with him. Verse 9, I will make them a tear and an evil for all the kingdoms of the earth. So again, this is talking about the bad figs, those remaining in the land. Those, those fighting against serving the king of Babylon, those not going into captivity, but remaining in the land in this pollution and the defilement of their wickedness and where that wickedness have brought them now. God says, I will make them a terror and evil for the kingdoms of the earth, a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all the places where I will scatter them. Verse 10, uh, finishing up this chapter, I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence upon them until they are destroyed from the land which I gave to them and their forefathers. Destroyed with the land, God says. This curse, I'll make them a taunt. It's going to get destroyed, sword, pestilence. All these things will be brought upon those who choose to remain in their wickedness, in their sin, in their pollution, in their defilement of what they brought about upon this land, upon the blessings that God had given the people. God says, this is your land. I'm giving you this land. He led them into that land, going clear back in the wilderness that God is leading his people into this promised land. That God said, here's this land. You're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God. God provided. God blessed them. God gave them victory after victory. He was their God. He met with them. He spoke to them. He gave them everything they needed. And in all these blessings, the people turned from the Lord. They polluted those blessings. They turned from them and they made their own, their own world of striving and going after happiness and what they wanted, what they felt, what they thought, forsaking the Lord, bowing down to other things, worshiping other things. Their priorities were all jacked up. This was defiled. And the Lord says, your judgment for this, even though he's still giving clear instructions, there's life, there's good figs, but here's death. And these are the bad figs and they will be destroyed with the land, with this land that was intended to be a blessing. And now is the cause of their destruction because of what they have made it out to be. Okay, going into chapter 25. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, so he is speaking to the people and he says, these 23 years, the word of the Lord has come to me. So Jeremiah is speaking to the people saying, for 23 years, I've spoken to you. For 23 years, the Lord has sent me to speak truth to you. And he says, and I have spoken to you again and again, but you have not listened. Verse four, and the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets again and again, but you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear. Verse five, saying, turn now everyone from his evil way and from the evil of your deeds and dwell in the land which the Lord has given to you and your forefathers forever and ever. Do not go after other gods to serve them. Do not worship them. Do not provoke me to anger with the work of your hands and I will do you no harm. So Jeremiah says, for 23 years I have come. The Lord has called me to speak to you for these years, brought other prophets, real prophets, not false prophets, to speak this truth, saying that these lands will be destroyed. We go back to the books of the Bible that we read in Isaiah and Micah and Obadiah and um, all of these that we read very clearly. 
these prophets coming and speaking this destruction, but speaking with this destruction saying, just listen to the Lord, turn from the Lord, stop worshiping these things, turn from your evil ways and God will do you no harm. God will bring about blessings. They were told, they were warned. This truth was spoken over and over and over again. But the response of the people in verse seven, yet you have not listened to me, declares the Lord, in order that you might provoke me to anger with the work of your hands to your own harm. Again, it's our choice and what we choose. When we choose to turn from the Lord, we choose to harm ourselves. The work of your hands to your own harm is what the Lord speaks. You provoked me to anger with the things that you have done for your own destruction, that you have chosen this. Verse eight, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all these nations round about. Continuing on in that Babylon will reign. Babylon will come up against God's people. Babylon will come and bring the destruction that the people have chosen in that choice of harming themselves with the work of their own hands and turning away from the Lord and worshiping other idols, other gods, and doing their own thing. So we hear, we um, Jeremiah clearly lays it out. Look, this message has come. This is what the Lord's still saying. He's going to continue saying, he's gonna continue speaking this because he will see this judgment through. So talking about Babylon from the north coming and all their families, um, says, all the families of the north, I will send King Nebuchadnezzar against you. Then we see verse 11, this whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation. So the Lord lays this out clearly. For 70 years, Babylon will reign, that my people will serve Babylon in captivity for 70 years, but then says, then Babylon will be punished. God will not allow a wicked nation to be a superpower, to be reigning, to be in charge, to continue growing in strength. He will not allow that to continue. If this is a wicked nation, the Lord may use them to bring about judgment on these other nations, on Jerusalem themselves, but they will not. Their reign, their success will not prevail. That wickedness, God cannot continue to bless wickedness. God will use those who are choosing wickedness for those other people who are choosing wickedness to come together and judgments happen and punishment happen. But the Lord says Babylon will reign for a time, but then they will be punished. Verse 13, I will bring upon that land all my words, which I have pronounced against it, all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah has prophesied against all the nations. So Jeremiah is speaking, Jeremiah come and giving the, the words of the Lord. God is saying what I have spoken through Jeremiah already, what you have already heard that's coming up against Jerusalem, that's coming up against Babylon, that's coming up against the other nations, it will be done. So continuing on in that with all the nations, we start um, starting in verse 15. This is talking directly to, speaking to all of the nations. Just God just lays them out. And it says in verse 15, for thus the Lord, the God of Israel says to me, take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. So the Lord is speaking to Jeremiah, gives Jeremiah a cup and says, take this cup and cause the nations to drink this. Verse 17, then I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me to drink it. So Jeremiah is speaking this then against the other nations. Verse 18, he starts off in this list of nations that the judgment of God is coming up against. Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and its kings and its princes to make them a ruin, a horror, a hissing, and a curse as it is this day. Right off the bat, we're gonna hit the nation of Jerusalem and Judah, God's people, judgment's coming. You've turned from the Lord, judgment's coming. Then he goes on in this crazy list. We see in verse 19, Egypt. We see in verse 20, the foreign people and, and all the kings of the land of Uz. We see Philistines with Ashkelon, um, Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod. We see in 21, Edom, Moab, sons of Ammon, Verse 22, we see Tyre and Sidon, kings of the coastlands, which are beyond the sea. In 23, we see Dedan and Tema, um, Buz. Verse 24, we see Arabia and the kings of the foreign people who dwell in the desert. 
I mean, God is hitting them all and speaking through Jeremiah in such specifics and such detail of who these people are, not just saying all the nations, but that God would choose to name them to say, hey, no, God, this judgment, these judgments of the Lord, they're coming against you. Uh, verse 25, Zimri and Elam, uh, Media. Then we see in 26, and the kings of the north, near and far, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the earth, which are upon the face of the ground, and the king of Sheshach shall drink after them. And I'm like, why wouldn't they mention Babylon? Because they just said Babylon will reign, but he will be punished. But then I see in uh, Sheshach, which I didn't know this, totally learned this. Sheshach is another name for Babylon. So, so interesting that Jeremiah, when he speaks this, he would start with Jerusalem and Judah and then end with Babylon. This is huge. This Babylonian captivity, it's huge. For 70 years, the people will serve the king of Babylon. So starting with Jerusalem and Judah saying, hey, you know, you were the ones that I've chosen. You were the ones I called out. This judgment's coming against you. Then everyone, everyone after the Lord lays out and ends with Babylon, that even you, Babylon, even you, the ones who will rise up in power, who will be this super crazy, crazy, crazy super nation, a superpower of the world at this time, that even you, the judgments will come against you. Verse 27, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, drink, be drunk, vomit, fall and rise no more because of the sword which I am which I will send among you. Then in 28, we see even if you don't want to drink, you're going to drink. You're going to drink this judgment. No one can stop it because God is the God, the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of all powers and all of his holiness and all of his justice and all of his righteousness. He is a righteous God. He rewards those who, who, um, who choose to live in righteousness. He punishes those and comes up against those who live in wickedness. Then we see in 30 and 31, um, the Lord just saying, Jeremiah, prophesy truth. You just go in there, you prophesy truth and say judgment is coming. We see at the end of 31, he is entering into judgment with all flesh. Jeremiah is speaking this about the Lord. As for the wicked, he has given them to the sword, declares the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, evil is going forth from nation to nation and a great storm is being stirred up from the remotest parts of the earth judgments come in. Verse 33, those slain by the Lord on that day will be from one end of the earth to the other. They will not be lamented, gathered, or buried. They will be like dung on the face of the ground. Even this, um, the Lord spoke to Jeremiah back in Jeremiah chapter 16 and said the same exact thing. The Lord is speaking and then he confirms it and he speaks it again. He gives us the same message, the same truth. Sometimes he speaks it over and over and over again. When that happens, we have such a tendency of rolling over, of just, you know, okay, I've heard it before, it's no big deal, but every time God speaks it, and we need to take it to heart every time. But even in this, even in such gloom and such darkness, the Lord's speaking it, saying, remember when I said that? Remember when I used Jeremiah to speak this to you? And saying that they won't be lamented or gathered or buried, they'll be like dung on the face of the ground? This is happening. Wake up repent, seek me, return to me, trust me. All of this, these warnings that God gives over and over again. But we saw that same thing spoken through Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 16, 4. Okay, so this finishes up. Uh, let's jump down to 36 at the end for the Lord is destroying their pasture. Um, ending on the last verse 38, he has left his hiding place like the lion for their land has become a horror because of the fierceness of the oppressing sword and because of his fierce anger. This is the Lord saying this judgment is as sure as can be, that this wickedness, this defilement, it's gotta be wiped out, taken away, removed, because God has a plan. He has a purpose. His, his desire, his heartbeat screams that his people are awakened, that his people are brought back to himself, that restoration needs to happen. And not just where they're at, but God needs to remove them. Remember, he says those bad figs will remain where they're at. But God is about removing us, taking us out of that so we're not exposed, so we're not in the mix of it. God wants a newness. God wants us cleaned up. God wants us surrounded by his righteousness, by who he is. So he is at work. He has this purpose to remove us from the evil, be brought into where we can truly encounter the Lord, where we can truly see his power, where he can restore us and authentic, like for real healing can take place. That's what he's after. Not just this surfacey, I feel better, but hey, we're getting down deep. 
And, and if that takes a journey of some pain and some 70 years of being held in captivity, if that's what it takes to get us real, to get us truly in the midst of the presence of the Lord, experiencing the magnitude of his power and his healing, then that's what God's going to do because he's after us in a real way. And he wants us living life in a real, powerful, free, abundant way. <sighs> That's what he's about. Let's just trust him. Let's go after him. Let's listen. Even when things don't quite make sense, like what? Being Babylonian captivity, this is like for us. This is for our good. You got a plan in this. Doesn't make sense. But guys, his love, his reckless love does not make sense for us. Let's trust him. Let's cling to him. Let's keep diving in deeper and learning more, discovering more, and just saying, God, have your way. We love you and letting him take us on the ride of a lifetime. I choose him no matter what. I'd rather be with him in the lowest, darkest, deepest valley than on the highest mountain living my life up without him and not aware of him and what a miserable life that would be. Okay, thanks so much for walking this out. This is getting good. So excited for more of what God has to show us. Can't wait to continue on this journey with you. So keep up with me. Uh, check out my next video. Let's do this thing together. Let's keep growing and being so for real and purposeful in this. This is His Word Unveiled. I'm checking out. See you soon.